So good morning, everyone. Um, and welcome to the last day of the Philosophy, Disability, and Social Change Conference. I am uh, Tamsin Komodo. I'm going to be chairing the session. Um, and I wanted to start by saying thank you to Jonathan and Shelley for organizing this conference uh, and to all of the staff who've been working on it and making it uh, accessible. I am especially grateful to whomever is captioning. As someone who relies heavily on captioning, you've been doing a wonderful job. Um, so let me introduce our, oh, let me begin by actually talking a bit about the format. So uh, if you are in need of captions and they're not on, if along the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a closed caption option and you can turn them on that way. Uh, we ask that you submit questions using the Q&A function um, which is located right next to the closed caption function. And uh, questions that are submitted there will be asked to the presenter. Ones that appear in the chat, unfortunately, we may not see. So please do use the Q&A function to submit your questions. Um, Emily will speak for about 30 minutes, and then there's about 20 minutes of Q&A. So I'll, now I will introduce Emily. Um, so Emily R. Douglas is a PhD candidate, candidate at McGill University in philosophy, coming to us today from Montreal, traditional unceded lands of the Kanyangahaga. Previously, Emily earned a BA and a master's degree from the University of Alberta. <coughs> Emily, like myself, uses they pronouns. They are the co-editor of the first special issue in Puncta, a journal of critical phenomena phenomenology, along with Corinne LeJoy on new phenomenologies of illness, madness, and disability. And they're here to talk to us today about phenomenologies of debilitation and questions of volition. So welcome, Emily. Great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you, Tamsin, for this introduction. Thank you so much, Shelly and Jonathan, for this yeah, this incredibly like accessible across time zones, across locations um, conference, just highlighting disabled philosophers. Um, I am going to uh, paste a slightly longer um, land acknowledgement in the chat. Um, as Josh said yesterday, I think it's important when we're all sort of talking floating heads to um, say where we're coming from. So yes, right now I'm coming to you from um, Montreal, um, which is uh, for all. Uh, yes, now the captioners will be able to take off the names. Good. Um, so the presentation which I um, am going to be giving today, the first two thirds of it are from a chapter I recently finished in my dissertation, um, and the last third is kind of in progress. Um, I think it carries over quite well from some of the questions that Michelle had about medically unexplained symptoms. Um, so with all that, we'll start. So in The Right to Maim, Jasbir K. Puar argues that debilitation and the production of disability are in fact biopolitical ends unto themselves, which massify and maim a population in order to maintain control, international respect, or to make all bodies profitable. So in this presentation, I provide a phenomenological supplement to Puar's analysis of debilitation through the work of Franz Fanon. Through a specific case of torsion dystonia of a young North African patient of Fanon's, Antoine F., we see how the debilitation of occupied Tunisians and Algerians was both experienced materially and used to capacitate symbolic colonial structures through paradoxical overdetermination and undermining of will, agency, and volition. So my presentation today has three parts. The first part is an explainer of debility as a framework and how we might begin to explore phenomenology of debilitation. The second part is the discussion of muscle dystonia in Fanon's work. Uh, and the third section uh, involves the links between what I'm calling muscularized disabled movement 
and feminist theoretical strategies um, for challenging our assumptions about volition. So the first part uh, is debilitation. What is it? How might we approach it phenomenologically? Who are argues that the contemporary Western neoliberal construction of disability as a special case, as an accident, or as something that could be overcome and cured depends upon a shadow notion of debility. Both disability and debility carry some connotations of impairment for the general public, yet debility points to intentional injury while disability is typically thought of or often thought of as accidental or congenital. Huar points out that in naming and recognizing some subjects as disabled, others are excluded as not deserving of care. More precisely, they are excluded because the process of their debilitation is both profitable and illegible in disability rights frameworks. This debilitation is frequently at a geographical and temporal distance with governments, quote unquote, here in the global North or West, debilitating and exploiting the elsewhere, um, which makes it quite easy to uh, elide and cover over these things. So debilitation then is a mechanism used by both governmental and non-governmental forces to massify conditions of injury and disperse them throughout a population. Debilitation is primarily a temporal and processual heuristic that is a tool to be used by a regime of political power rather than a place where subjects could be located as debilitated rather than disabled, right? Further, debilitation does not involve only a loss or a lack or putting things out of play, but it makes them available for maiming, for profit, or other ways of making so-called useless lives useful. So Pura calls this capacitation the uses that come out of debilitation as intentional injury. One more advantage that debilitation gives us um, is that it as a broad process opens us up to considerations of chronic illness, uh, medically unexplained symptoms and psychiatric access, right? So part of studying debilitation will precisely require attention to the non-apparent, the sick but not disabled, and the myriad of health conditions that remain unknown. So as I said in this talk, I want to sketch possibilities for phenomenologies of debilitation. And I suggest that this is important in the field of phenomenology of disability. Uh, where there are still many philosophical studies that are not necessarily critical, politicized, and they may often rely upon impairment as a brute medicalized fact. Uh, further, there is the risk if one follows only classical forms of phenomenology of losing sight of structural issues and a too tight focus on an individual. Whereas these classical forms of phenomenology sought to uncover purportedly universal structures of experience, contemporary formulations of critical phenomenology, many of which draw directly upon Fanon's work and method, frequently hold that phenomenology as a method must also question our social structures, our gendered and racialized habits, and that it must strive not only for descriptive, but for ethical ends. So it's in line with these critical phenomenologies that I want to work. Puar states that the difference between disability and debility, this is a quote, is not derived from expounding upon and contrasting phenomenological experiences of corporeality but from evaluating the violences of biopolitical risk and metrics of health, fertility, longevity, education, and geography. 
So these are not two different categories of phenomenologies that she thinks we're making, right? It's not coming out only through lived experience. Um, still, I hold that we can use this framework um, to look at the different experiences of the debilitated and disabled without placing them in two binary categories, allowing some movement. As Margaret Schildrick insists, an acute sensibility towards how debility is phenomenologically experienced uh, would greatly enrich considerations of disability by phenomenologists. Um, so taking this into account, phenomenologies of debility would not be of a separate order from phenomenologies of disability, but would contribute to the broadening of such philosophical examinations. Uh, so in the following section, I'm going to extend Puar's theorization of debility to reading Fanon's late 50s and early 60s work. Uh, apologies to the uh, captioners for how many mentions of phenomenology there were in the last couple of minutes. So section two. So there are many disparate readings of muscular tension and spasms in the wretched of the earth, as well as disagreements over to what degree Fanon might be endorsing refusal as a mode of resistance. Though muscles are not explicitly thematized nor given their own chapter, muscular tension abounds in his descriptions of both colonized individuals and the populations. For some brief examples, Fanon describes muscular dreams, aggression as sedimented in muscles, the release of this tension through dance or ritual, the seizing of the muscles in the face of colonial values. Some Fanon scholars have interpreted this muscular tension as a reflection of an inner wish to political resistance or as a straightforward symptomatic disabling that is only produced by the oppressive social environment. Um, so in this section, I'm going to consider how these uh, so-called psychosomatic muscular disorders or capacitated for colonial ends. As Fanon notes, many of the patients he treated in both Algeria and Tunisia had dystonias and hypertonias. Uh, in fact, muscular rigidity appears in a whole group of his psychosomatic patients in the wretched of the earth. There are men with trouble climbing, running, or walking quickly, unable to bend their, eggs, their legs easily. He says of one patient that, quote, no relaxation can be achieved. Immediately rigid and incapable of relaxing of his own free will, the patient seems to be made in one piece. He is constantly tense, on hold, between life and death. So all these symptoms are implicated within the colonial context and they take on a role in medical treatment. Contemporary works in physiology and anatomy define hypertonia simply as an abnormal increase in muscle tone, while dystonia is a so-called movement disorder with involuntary muscle contractions, either intermittent or continuous, that result in twisting, repetition, repetition, and quote, abnormal postures. Rigidity on this clinical level is hypertonia present in all passive and active movements. It's worth noting that clinicians disagree upon and use various different tests to assess muscle tone, as well as that empirical studies have not found any consistent interracial differences in muscle mass or muscle tone. Yet stillness and rigidity were, and I suggest still often are, capacitated to facilitate colonial occupation. Whereas Fanon notes Sub-Saharan African Blacks and members of this diaspora have often been likened to animals in justifications for invasion or colonization, 
He notes that North Africans and Arabs were subject to the trope of being part of the landscape, vegetative, having instinctive lives, being inert and stable. And I suggest that these opinions were not mere side effects of the colonization, but actually a necessary part of making the land and state ready for occupation. So I'm going to read this muscular tension in connection with both stiffness and agitation. Um, I'm riffing, beginning the riff off of Mel Chan's paper on ag agitation where they highlight that often, quote, tension is the condition shared between a sent sedimented rigidity and the movement that is then dubbed insurgency or agitation. Very few scholars have written about the phenomenon of agitation in the psychiatric milieu or on a case of torsion spasm. Nevertheless, I hold that these two lesser known psychiatric papers, which Fanon wrote with colleagues, reveal the entanglement of muscular tension with agitation. I engage these papers uh, in conversation with Chen's investigation into the links between forms of agitation and the mechanisms of power that are formed around agitation. So agitation is not an incidental symptom among those in the psychiatric hospital, nor is it univocal in its presentation. It has often been and still is today treated as a problem in itself and met with punishments coded as treatments, such as physical restraint, forced chemical treatment, and or isolation from patients and staff. Rather than viewing agitation as an external influence or a willful outburst, Fanon and Asile describe it as produced by confinement. Further, they state that, quote, agitation is above all a modality of existence, an expressive style. The agitated individual at once does and does not know what he is doing. Or if you will, he does not know what he is doing, but he is trying to find out. So in combination with this uh, bridge through agitation, we find agitated movement in the paper, a case of torsion dystonia. This paper focuses on the case of 21 year old Antoine F, a young man who they treated in Tunis. Based on the hospital population records, he has a high likelihood of being Tunisian or Algerian. Antoine had various motor abnormalities under the name of dystonia from a young age, and he began experiencing seizures at 20. So Antoine's motility is the most distinctive aspect of this report for me. Fanon and Levy observed that his leg extensors were permanently hypertonic, as were his anti-gravity muscles, the ones holding him off the ground, yet his muscular strength was intact, not lost. Fanon and Levy also emphasize the rhythm and action of Antoine's spasms, how they follow in a chain, one after another, spreading like an avalanche. Overall, they observe, this is a quote, anarchic, anarchic intempestive spasms involving the head, the trunk, the right arm, determine a twisted, undulating, mannered, jolting walk in the matter of a dislocated puppet, end quote. Antoine leans against walls to balance cephalic spasms and the authors say his gait is like a, quote, macabre clown. So the macabre clown description comes from Danish psychiatrist August Wimmer's analysis of dystonia. And Fanon and Levy use the phrase twice. Um, this is a phrase that really struck out, stuck out at me when I was reading. Um, because it presents dystonia as primarily about movement and it engages with this whole background of notions of racialized motility, immobility, and rigidity. Um, 
So Wimmer, from whom they took the clown phrase, also refers to the Greek myth of Laokun. I'm going to put that in the chat just in case they didn't get that. Laokun. Um, and this is a Greek myth. Um, this Greek figure is often shown in sculptures that really emphasize his facial expressions of suffering. So the clown uh, and Laokun connote the subject of torsion spasms as something to laugh at, but also something in pain, something grotesque and associated with death. Um, so of course, much of the normative and normate image of the human has focused around a model of a brightness and clear movement, whereas jerks interrupt smoothness and fluidity and jagged movements here disrupt normalcy. Um, in this case, I think that fantasies of normate human movement are already racialized and Antoine's movement is doubly pathologized. In my phenomenological experiments here, I want to caution against making any specific interpretation of Antoine's lived experience as an individual. He is capacitated in the clinic as sick, as part of a mass of disabled Algerians who have become patients for colonial psychiatry. We can say whether he experienced muscular tension, how he reported it, and how measurements changed over time but we must not appeal to descriptions of Antoine's movement or his testimonies as pure or unmediated experience, nor indeed do we have proper access. Um, so Antoine is in fact only one example among many that I think we could use as fragments for a phenomenology of debility. Um, and to read Antoine as a heroic, as a heroic resistant figure, um, might make him seem like ex an exception in contrast to the others suffering around him. Uh, so Fanon does not indeed prioritize Antoine in his writing, nor indeed does any single individual dominate in the wretched of the earth. Um, so I'm going to briefly enter the third section of the talk. Um, and in this section, I briefly draw upon three feminist philosophical accounts of ascriptions of volition um, in order to think through debilitation um, and how, yeah, debilitation is related to the will. Um, yeah, so this part of the talk is very much sketchier. Um, I'm going to discuss three concepts. These are first, racial ability tuning from Mel Chen. Second, social authoring from Alicia Biera. Um, and I'll talk just a little bit about willfulness uh, in Sarah Ahmed's sense. Um, and I'm really open if anybody has ideas on how these um, three things may work together, may work differently, if one is uh, more advantageous than the other for my purposes. So the first notion that I bring in is from Mel Chen's um, work on agitation, which I've already mentioned. And Chen explains racial ability, racialized ability tuning, which they describe as, quote, a form of disability or difference soaked embodiment, or a kind of gestural containment to which all are subject and whose entrainments can be biopolitically managed. So this is a kind of tuning that they say happens between subjects following unwritten, racialized, um, and sort of disability-focused gestural codes. Uh, for example, Chen describes instances of police violence against disabled, agitated Black people as being a site of gestural wrongs or mistunings, uh, and therefore different attributions of volition. However, they ask if this was a gestural wrong that violated rules of racial attunement, whose was it? If the agitation of disabled movement is a matter of tuning that cannot be guaranteed from one side or another, then I suggest this provides reason to question not only our dominant understandings of agency, but also how these understandings are sedimented as habits. Um, and Chen also has a long example in that paper from Bergson's work on laughter, 
where they trace how uh, Bergson suggests that if we look at a hunchback, at first the volition and the willfulness of his posture will seem to come out of his body. But if you watch long enough, um, you will come to decide it is the sort of stubbornness of the man behind it. So this is part of, this is another part of the norms of tuning. Yeah. So my second strand of thought that um, I think is related to social tuning, uh, to racial ability tuning, uh, comes from feminist philosopher Alicia Vieira, Vieira in her discussions of agency and intention. In Missing in Action, Violence, Power, and Discerning Agency, Vieria articulates a framework for considering agency of the oppressed, particularly focusing her concerns on violence against Black women. And she argues that when we consider uh, different acts, different things, intention is not just authored by a single agent through their practical reasoning, but she says it is also socially authored through your other's translation of her action. So Bieria is distinguishing social authoring from mere reading or interpretation, which draw upon a pre-existing meaning. Authoring is instead part of the creation of meaning. And so social authoring would work backwards to author the intentions of an individual, right? So I'm thinking here of Antoine, I'm thinking here of um, the other kinds of muscular tension and what gets authored in that movement. Uh, and one brief third interjection, which is that I think these questions about muscular volition um, link to Sarah Ahmed's work in Willful Subjects. So as Ahmed has pointed out, often racialized and otherwise subjugated individuals uh, are subject to both depiction as overly willful or as willless as defiant or chaotic and out of control. She notes that descriptions or denials of will are ways to order human experience and distribute moral worth. Indeed, it's significant that willfulness and weakness of will are both diagnoses. Uh, even today, some cognitive scientists and psychiatrists will use the term disorders of the will or disorders of volition. Uh, to be too willful is to be sick or disordered, just as to have no will or a lack of a will also is. Uh, so really quick, social authoring, racialized ability tuning and will then are three vectors through which I think we can examine the phenomenology of debilitation and to see how debilitation is seized and used. For example, we can consider colonial French forces as seizing existing muscle tension in the colonized, as well as creating tension um, through their uh, hostile atmosphere and translating this into general statements whereby North Africans were cast as willless objects or overly willing towards violence. We could see this in Bieria's terms as social authoring in discordant systems of meaning. For example, in the authoring of the North African syndrome as a diagnosis, uh, as a psychosomatic disorder that only uh, affected the colonized in North Africa. And I suggest we can see how these uses of debilitation uh, by colonial forces uh, would lead into certain forms of racialized ability tuning with regard to the movement of racialized and disabled bodies. Okay, so um, to conclude real quick, in this paper, I have argued that um, considering debility phenomenologically unsettles typical assumptions about will, volition and agency in regards to racialized and disabled individuals. So first I foregrounded the importance of the debility framework itself to rethinking philosophies of disability and laid the groundwork for phenomenologies of debil debilitation. Second, I brought this framework to Fanon's late work on psychiatry by viewing muscular tension and rigidity, not as psychosomatic, but as debilitation. Uh, 
And finally, uh, I am still exploring how a phenomenology of debilitation gives us critical insight into these assignations. Oh, sorry. Critical insight into these assignations of will, volition, and agency. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, so much uh, for that talk. Um, and for the audience, as a reminder, please submit your questions through Q&A, um, and then I will ask them to Emily on your behalf. Um, what a fascinating presentation. I appreciate so much your attention to Fanon's clinical writings, which I think tend to be overlooked in the philosophical literature yeah. on Fanon um, and discussions of the colonial neurosis. So thank you again for uh, attending so well to that. Um, I'm going to start asking questions from the audience. And our first one comes to us from Shelley Tremaine. Um, and Shelley says, Emily, thank you for an illuminating talk. At the outset of your presentation, you said that you thought there were a number of connections between Michelle's presentation and your own. Mm -hmm. I perceived a number of continuities, but I'd like to know what you think these connections are. Yeah, um, so I was, I was really, um, excited to hear Michelle's talk coming up to this because I was thinking, oh, we're going to have a lots of, yeah, lots of meeting places, both for us and for the audience. Um, so I think one of the things is that um, Michelle was considering how CFS um, is in some ways produced by capitalism, right? Considering, um, and so I think we're both holding this tension of, as somebody asked, well, like if it's produced by capitalism and it there were no capitalism, like what, what would happen? Would we have these kinds of disabilities? Um, and I think in a similar way, I'm considering how certain kinds of debilitations or debilities um, are produced um, and then used for colonial forces, right? Um, while also, yeah, while also like attending to, because I think both she and I want to really attend to like the literal physiological things that are going on at the same time. Um, yeah, I also think this question um, that was approached in the discussion period with Michelle's work over like, is this, um, is this a kind of embodied resistance or like what is the relationship of the symptom with the political environment? Um, that part is really close like in um, with the work of my whole dissertation and trying to figure out um, like what are the political uses of saying it's resistance or not resistance um, and how do we hold these things at once yeah yeah uh, thank you um so our next question comes to us from benjamin carpenter and benjamin says thank you for a fantastic presentation it's always great to hear from others working within critical phenomenology. I was wondering if you had further thoughts on the spatiality of muscular tension, how this tension impacts the subject's relation to the space around them, or perhaps to their ability to take a place within it. I'm thinking here of how the way one is able or unable to move through a space shapes agency, but mm -hmm. also serves as a site of willfulness would be great to hear any of your thoughts on this. Yeah, um, yeah, I love this question. I think there's um, there's so much room for this kind of work and there's lots of seeds to pull out of. So um, one of the things that I've been thinking about is Fanon makes some remarks about like, you must use all of your weight against the colonizers or like you must let them drag you, you must, um, you know, like rigidity and force is like uh, sticking down. Um, and that might be part of like willful non-movement um, as well as willful movement. Yeah, I also like, I'm thinking a lot about the different kinds of, right? If your muscles are like habitually constrained in certain ways, um, 
this means like certain kinds of um, movements are, are not open to you, but certain kinds of movements might be open to you that are not open to many others. Um, and this, yeah, I think one of the, one of the sources that I'm looking at, I've seen a number of phenomenological studies that um, really work with the muscles and kinesiology, but without as much of a political uh, bridge to it. Um, but I'm really interested in one of the authors who I like is Maxine Sheets Johnstone, which I'll put in the chat. Um, yeah, I think it's a fabulous question um, and I hope to be working more on it in the future. Uh, thank you, Benjamin. Um, I think I'm gonna exercise my moderator privilege to ask you uh, a question. Um, I also do work in critical phenomenology and Fanon is a, is a really key touchstone for that um, kind of work. And I have a couple of questions in that sort of vein. Um, mm -hmm. So the first one, so you started the third section by saying, I have these three strands in this thinking about mm -hmm. and, and I'm and you're, you're trying to think through um, further connections. Um, and I wanted to tune into a med for a second mm -hmm. um, and think not necessarily with her discussion of willfulness so much as where I think she and Fanon really meet is on the question of historicity um, mm -hmm. and the need for, and I think this follows up on Benjamin's question as well, the need for an account of historicity and the development of space, spatialization, spatiality. Uh, I'm thinking here of Fanon's discussion of the racial epidermal schema, um, yeah. Ahmed's discussion of Orientalism. And I wonder if there's something, if there's a link there, right, for thinking about volition uh, mm -hmm. as something that is spatially historically constituted, right, through mm -hmm. this kind of critical analysis of debility. Um, in a way that I think allows for not kind of uh, either denigrating or valorizing the condition yeah. of uh, people acting under these kinds of circumstances or making claims about their bodies, et cetera, right? Um, mm -hmm. Doing that kind of critical move of getting beyond the, the sort of bare experience of the subject. Um, so I wonder if that's, a different tack to take, not the willful subject, mm -hmm. but the language of Orientalism and orientation from a mad. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah. Like, I think one of the things that I'm wanting to do with this project is um, kind of, people talk about the body schema and the, the racial epidermal schema and the historical schema and went on, and I love it. And then I'm like, okay, and what, um, what are the other like le levels of things related to this? Like what is going on, um, what is going on in, in the body and in the space, right? That is, um, that is motivating these changes or motivating um, these differences in physiological experience. Yeah, I think one of the, one of the things that I was really taking from Ahmed is in this is like, it's like she's talking about the will, but not assuming the will kind of thing. Um, in my head, I've been thinking about it as kind of like reading sideways to the will. Um, and I do think that there are lots of, now I'm like, oh, sideways, that's also an orientation. Um, <laughs> yeah, now I think there are lots of really um, nice places to go. Yeah, I wonder, how the discussion of orientation ties in with the discussion about like, is movement good? Is like far movement good? Is fluid movement good? Um, what if you have um, certain kinds of orientations, um, but your way of moving along that line is different, right? Um, yeah, I don't know, really good. I thank you so much for your question. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there's so much in your 
presentation. It's a very rich project. Um, I'll jump to a question from the audience and then we'll see if I have time to interject my own again. So uh, Jonathan Wolf asks, is the argument building on Fanon that colonial oppression both creates and makes use of debilitation? Is this thought of as a vicious circle? Mm. Um, overall, I would say yes. <laughs> uh, overall, um, yeah, I do think that Puar brings to it, hmm, she helps us draw things out of Fanon. Like I think the production um, of Debility that may or may not um, like stand out to people in the same way, whereas I think the uses definitely do. Um, yeah, I think in a way it definitely, it's like, colonial systems are producing a thing that will ensure the maintenance of their ongoing existence um, at the same time as sort of finding ways to manage these populations. Um, so that if the preconditions are there for them to draw on all the way through, I guess one of the things, um, if this is a vicious circle, how do we get out of it? Um, that, yeah, I'm like, I think, I think that, yeah, I really do think this is like very important and central to a lot of the workings of colonization. Um, and so like, I wonder if it would also require like undoing a bigger project. Yeah, I'm not sure. Am I speaking to your question, Jonathan? Well, it, it's good. I mean, it, it just seems to me this is like um, ways in the ideology might function, for example. Yes. So, 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 so that um, systems create myths about themselves, which are in some ways bad for the people who hold those myths, but at the same time help cement the power. Um, so yeah. I, I, I think there's some of the effects of trauma, for example, yes. that, that come out in physical and mental ways in the colonized subject also makes mm -hmm. them weak, weaker and less able to oppose the, the system. So it, it just felt to me that there was, I was it's not something yeah. I thought about before, but it feels to me like this is almost a physical analog of ideology going on. Yeah, and it's... Um, so one of the things that I didn't talk about um, from Puar is that she she notes that like once one is debilitated or disabled, there's sort of um, two ways in which you're taken up, right? Either you're taken up as an object of care, which is like, yeah, you're disabled, you're sick, you're recognized. Um, we know these certain things are necessary. Um, or you're called, well, she's, she uses a few different terms. One is like degraded objects or like useless um, objects, right? Whereas like the, the debilitation that is happening in one's body is also denied to be real, is said to be like psychosomatic um, as in the case of the North African syndrome, right? Um, so it's sort of a, I don't know, a double blow there, <laughs> yeah. Um, so our next question comes from Suze Burkhout. Um, Thank you, Emily. Would you be able to say a bit more about the continuities and divergences with respect to some of the different forms of muscular tensions you've described? For example, agitation with the psychiatric setting versus torsions versus spasms and how those might index concepts like willfulness in different ways. Yeah, thank you, Suze. Um, yeah, I think one of the things that I'm trying to do here, um, inspired in some ways by Chen, is following this uh, thread of agitation through. Um, so I, like I see, whereas um, a dystonia or torsion spasm is sort of like very specific uh, diagnostic descriptor. I see agitation as this way of um, 
being able to talk about multiple sort of experiences of disability at once. Um, and I also think that um, there is a vagueness already present in the notion of um, agitation. So that when agitation, um, even when it appears within the psychiatric hospital, um, right? Like whether it is like a lot of movement or whether it is like very little movement or whether it is um, verbal uh, agitation or whether it is kind of like wringing one's hands um, that there's already, yeah, I think there's already a slide going on here um, at least in the eyes of a lot. Um, yeah, I'm like, yeah, and I, I think one of the things that I like about it as well is that it therefore is able to bridge what we might say are like very different experiences of disability um, from one another. Um, yeah, I don't know if that helps. <laughs> I lost the end of the question because it disappeared, but. Um, how that might index different concepts like willfulness in different ways. Oh, yes, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's, um, yeah, I think with some of the present or like some of the things we think of as agitation, they're definitely thought of as, I think, I'm like, are more of them thought of as willful than will less? Yes, um, but at the same time, hmm, I think just like to some extent, the vision of the agitated patient is still like there's something external which is affecting them. And if we can stop this, then we can stop um, the agitation, right? Which would see the patient as kind of this like receptive, uh, helpless, uh, I don't know, flesh suit. Yeah, so I think I, I'm, I'm interested in that and like trying to map. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Suze. Yeah, um, I have more questions. Uh, so um, I have two questions that are going in very different directions, but I might ask them both at the same time mm -hmm. um, to see what you think of them. So my first thought is that one of the things that I appreciate about Fanon's sort of philosophical psychiatric analysis mm -hmm. of colonialism, capitalism, modernity, is that it's always bi-directional, uh, mm -hmm. right? That it's always an analysis of both colonizer and colonized. And I wonder how that um, fit, fits into this sort of critical phenomenology of debility that you're giving us, mm -hmm. right? Being Fanon, as the figure, right? Where's, uh, how do we think of this bi this kind of bi-directionality, this kind of bifurcated interconnected analysis that is so, I think, central and in many ways unique mm -hmm. to the Fanonian project. Um, and then my second question uh, is one that I, I myself have been wrestling with a lot um, and it's, inspired by the work of a colleague of mine, Axel Carrera, mm -hmm. uh, and I'll put the name in the chat. Um, and Carrera's reading of Fanon and her reading of phenomenology, uh, I think really productively suggests that we, those of us in the field of critical phenomenology who take Fanon as our starting point, um, mm -hmm. Have, are misunderstanding mm -hmm. uh, the Fanonian project if we think that it is phenomenological mm -hmm. um, as of the way in which he disintegrates notions of subjectivity or of humanity, right? It's a, a kind of Afro-pessimist reading of Fanon that are so central implicitly to the work we're doing. And I wonder how we think about that as we're taking up Fanon as mm -hmm. phenomenologist. Yeah, those are both two really good questions. Um, yeah, I'll say something briefly about both if we have a chance. Um, the first one, yeah, so um, working on this chapter, revisiting all these things, 
there's less in the the recently published psychiatric writings, but in um, the Wretched of the Earth, right, all these case studies, he has descriptions of um, the colonial soldiers and the torturers and the um, like daughter of a, like a prominent white businessman um, and how they also come to see him um, with different sorts of um, different sorts of problems, disorders um, than the uh, Algerians and Tunisians, which he's mostly treating. Um, and yeah, I think it is, I, like I wonder if um, it like backwards modifies, <laughs> modifies Puar's framework. Like, do we need something in Puar's framework about what happens to the not debilitated when uh, the, the others are being debilitated? Um, is it like a mere side effect or is it like built in somehow to the process um, that there will also be these um, like harms in some sense uh, on the other side? Yeah, yeah, I, for for now I, I've got like in the chapter, I've got like a note that's like, mm, I, I'm not gonna talk about these here, but um, I think, yeah, it's worth talking about the, also the here and the elsewhere that I mentioned, right? And how those function. Um, on the second thing, yeah, I read a little bit of Carrera's work. Um, I think I have two thoughts. Um, well, my first thought is like, okay, we can say that Fanon was undoing phenomenology and I'm still using him phenomenologically. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I really was inspired by um, one of the authors I read for this chapter was Derek Scott, um, who writes uh, about Fanon and black power. Uh, and one of the things that he does is he is like resoundedly unfaithful to Fanon in his, thing, in his writing. He's like, I don't actually care about getting right what Fanon said. What I care about is like how we can use what Fanon said um, towards my project. So I think the short answer is something like that, but then the long answer is, I don't know. <laughs> that's where I end up as well. So. <laughs> um, and I think that's our session so that we can give time uh, for a break between presentations. Thank you so much, Emily, for such Thank a wonderful- Thank you so much, everyone. Well, thank you both, uh, Emily and Townsend, for a really great session continuing in the uh, quality and interest of all the presentations we've had so far in the discussion. So I'm absolutely delighted. I'm sure uh, Shelley will join me 